So uh, we're about to hear a lot, communications are smart cities, secure cities. Our presenter is Scott Peresky of a lot, A-L-L-O-T, and he means a lot to us. <laughs> Scott is the, uh, the, the person who first brought the Real-Time Communications Lab a big industrial strength project. And that was when the uh, Real-Time Communications Lab was called the VoIP Lab, and it was located in Wheaton in the uh, Rice Campus facility. And Scott called up one day and said, can you do a, a project for my company, which was not a lot at the time, and uh, described it. And we did performance benchmark testing for, uh, for an industrial strength application layer firewall. So we have a long history together, and Scott will take it from here. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and thank you, Carol. And I, I do want to point out that it was long ago that we had that first project in your lab that the Cubs were still not at 100 years without winning a World Series. So it was in uh, 2004, right? So 100 years would be 2008. So it was only nine, 96 years without a World Series. But w we've been working together, collaborating for a very long time. I myself feel very privileged to have known you for so many years, and I think you do a great job. And in my experience working with your students, they've been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, OK, great. So uh, one thing I will need then is, is there a clicker to change slide pages? Or do I need to stand behind the podium like I'm a presidential candidate? <laughs> and this is the city of presidential candidates, right? So it could be somewhat appropriate. All right, well, I will, uh, You're trapped. I'll, I'm trapped. Uh, and it means I can't point at the screen either. Yeah. Does this roll out? Maybe this rolls out a little bit without pulling cables. Okay, good, that's a little better. All right, now we can get started. Sorry for the uh, technical delays, everybody, but it's uh, great to be back in Chicago. You guys over here are students? Uh, you're a student too? Okay. Are you undergrad or grad? Undergrad. Undergrad. Well, good for you guys. And you've come to a great school, and I think you've picked a very interesting and rewarding career. So uh, good for you guys. And uh, where is everybody else from if we start here? Rice. Hey, all right. Good. Yeah, okay, good. Oh, okay. Well, same words for you. You're, you, I'll guess you're a graduate. Oh, okay. You're a senior taking graduate classes. Oh. That that's a great option to take advantage of. Good for you. Okay, and you're with IIT. Yeah, everybody's here. Here is welcome. <laughs> oh, okay. And where are you from? <laughs> You're, hey, it's been so long. Oh my goodness. How are you? Oh, good. Great to see you again. And I have to admit, I, I saw you across the hall uh, when we we're outside there, and I thought he looks so familiar to me. So yes, it's great to see you again. And where are you from? Oh, congratulations. What are you doing next? Uh, because there happen to be Verizon and BT people here, if you didn't notice. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, our smart cities, secure cities. And by the way, I may run over the 2.30 time slot, but I've known VJ, who's speaking next for many years, probably since 2004, if not sooner. So I, I, I feel comfortable enough with my relationship with him that I can encroach into his time. Okay, so you'll speak after me. Okay, you're Larry? Yeah, all right, nice to meet you, Larry. All right, so there's a lot of talk about uh, smart cities right now, a lot of this going on in the US and Europe, but we have to ask the question, are smart cities secure cities? 
And I think at the end of this presentation, you'll really be wondering this yourself. If not having a direct answer, no, they're not secure cities. So global cyber threats, the U.S. is leading the world in cyber threats right now in many different categories, really we're under attack. And a lot of people, ordinary citizens, even in the security industry are not aware of this. So first, I'll give the caveat people may notice that are in the cybersecurity industry. I'm using Kaspersky, which is risky in the United States given recent recommendations and announcements, but I'll tell you they publish the best reports with the most thorough data. And for those of you wondering why there's an issue with Kaspersky, uh, Dr. Eugene Kaspersky meets at the KGB once a week. Uh, he's been seen going in and out. Uh, he's the founder in the of the company and still CTO, and it's believed he's involved in nefarious activities around the world and also working with the KGB. Because of that, uh, the U.S. government forbids any Kaspersky on the federal government network. They forbid Kaspersky on any operator network that does federal business. And just recently, uh, well, about a year ago, they actually issued an announcement recommending that any enterprise, uh, all enterprises in the U.S. should not be using Kaspersky. And that's why when, uh, when you go to any of these uh, any of these commercial stores now, Best Buy, whatever it may be, you can't buy Kaspersky anymore. They've actually taken it off the shelves. So I understand there's issue with Kaspersky in the US, but I'll repeat again, they offer the best published reports for public consumption. So that's why this data is here. So US and China leaders, uh, US and China leads the world in IoT infected devices. Those are the top two countries, US and China. U.S. and Russia are the leaders for the most banking Trojan infections, which means you're financially at risk. And this year, there's been a major attack around that that we'll get to. And the U.S. is the leader in the world for mobile ransomware. So getting your mobile device infected with ransomware, that happens the most in the United States. We lead the world there. Uh, some other key observations they published uh, in this first quarter report, the IoT attacks now, are the most sophisticated attacks. Uh, they're not just brute force where they're taking out a device uh, or impacting the network. They're now stealing information and using that information. Uh, the most downloaded IoT attack is this Linux Mirai backdoor attack. And 50% uh, of malware, mobile ransomware attacks is this Android OS attack. So if you have Apple, you know, the Apple says you're more secure. It's true. Uh, there are still some attacks at Apple. And this Android attack is more than 50% of the mobile ransomware attacks. So a big attack, it happened two years ago, to, uh, almost to the day. But it's still worth talking about because of the significance. There was the Dyne attack. What happened with Dyne is Chinese cameras got infected around the world, about 100,000 of them. Uh, with this uh, IoT malware. They became infected, and then from central command and control, all of them attack specific targets. The biggest one, the most noted, was the Dyne attack, which is a data center in Nashua, New Hampshire, little Nashua, New Hampshire, but it was actually founded by uh, some WPI students, uh, and just in their 20s, they started uh, the Dyne data center. They were housing the websites for The Guardian, Netflix, Reddit, CNN. And for this Dyne attack for two days, those websites were out. It was a DNS flood attack, huge volume, approaching terabit per second, and these websites were out. Now, because these websites were out, very well-known websites for Twitter, Netflix, CNN, this got front page news. Uh, this was in the Wall Street Journal. It was on the uh, 7 o'clock national news. So this really brought to the forefront the risk of cybersecurity attacks to the general public. This is really the first time that the general public started thinking about this. And that, even though this is two years old, that's why I include it. It's very significant. 
First, for the size of the attack and the fact that it brought it to the general public. This year, we had a new type of attack that's very significant. It didn't go after the end devices, my mobile device, my home computer. There was actually what we had, the VPN filter attack, which went after the home router. And when you think about it, it's genius. And why did, it, why did they wait until 2018 for the VPN filter attack? Because instead of going after individual devices, what if I just attacked the router in the home? And then from there, I could reach in to all the devices in the home or in the business uh, if, an if it hit an enterprise router. It bricked routers so that they couldn't be used. But then another thing it did, it used the Essler exploit to exploit HTTPS to insert information, spoof an HTTPS session, create their own HTTPS session so that they could see your banking information and when you establish a connection with your bank, create their own connection so that you think you're on a, a real connection, but at the same time, they're in your account draining your money. This, the, this is the most prolific attack we've had in the US. This one had immediate notification from DHS and the FBI telling everybody to upgrade the firmware on their home routers immediately. They even specifically notified Verizon and AT&T, telling them to proactively notify all of their customers to do this immediately because the impact of this could be horrific. So that happened just earlier this year, just a few months ago. People's face, facial expressions actually seem a little more nervous than when we started. Okay, good. That means you're understanding the problem. Now, what does this mean for smart cities? How many people here, I want you to be completely honest, how many people here know about the attack in Atlanta in March? Nobody. The city of Atlanta was attacked and out for six days in March. The police could not write speeding tickets. Court hearings had to be canceled. They couldn't do anything in the city. It was shut down. School, schools were canceled for the six days. Somebody infected the city with ransomware. Uh, they wanted tens of thousands of dollars. I forget the exact amount. Maybe it was $50,000. They wanted it all paid in Bitcoin. And, and that's the method these miscreants uh, use with the r ransomware. They want it paid in Bitcoin. But the city of Atlanta was out for six days. I found it funny. Now, I had to show this in PDF, so I couldn't walk through all the different screenshots. Uh, the first one back here shows that uh, Atlanta hosted a cybersecurity summit in the month of February, where industry leaders in, in cybersecurity all came to Atlanta. And I did find it ironic that just a month later, they got attacked uh, with this ransomware. So the city of Atlanta uh, was out for these six days. They tried to have their own IT organization solve the problem. The FBI advised them not to pay the ransomware. That's regular FBI policy and recommendation to all enterprises, municipalities, don't pay the ransomware because that gives, uh, that sets a precedent and they don't want uh, the bad actors out there to see this precedent that they'll get paid. So the recommendation is always don't pay it. So Atlanta didn't pay it based on that recommendation, but they didn't have the I IT expertise within their organization. They will after they hire you guys. So uh, it went on for days. They finally had the help of the FBI directly to help them recover. And at the end of the six days, they were up and running. But this was very significant. And what I found really interesting was so few people know, knew about it. I believe part of the reason is uh, the FBI was actually recommending too that news agencies don't spread this around a lot because they did not want the bad actors out there to know there was a success like this. Now they never got paid so it was never fully successful but they had, they had the impact. And you can see from the, this is the mayor of Atlanta, you can see the look on her face. You can only imagine what she's thinking. I know nothing about IT, why did I take this job? I didn't think we'd get anything. I'd have to deal with anything like this. Okay, 
So attacks on cities are real. IoT attacks, router attacks, those are real. Now let's bring that together and start looking at smart city use cases and, and what we really need to look at now. For every use case, there's a threat case. And we need to look beyond just the use cases and consider threat cases. So in a smart city, you're going to have smart healthcare, smart buildings, smart factories, smart energy, sensors, smart public works, smart transportation, meters, cameras, of course, all throughout the city. And then for each of these, you can come up uh, with different use cases, whether it be just for daily living within the city or even public safety within the city. But now, for all of these different use cases, we have to consider those threats. And you have to have a really warped mind to start thinking about all the bad ways now uh, that we could really disrupt life in a city and create havoc. So wh what if I could get in and I could, and I could change the signaling on streetlights in a city? Just that alone would cause havoc. I mean, think about the traffic in Chicago right now. Now imagine if we could go in and just, ch yeah, you're shaking, you commute to school, don't you? Yeah, so imagine just changing one street light at a busy intersection, the havoc that would cause there. Now what if we started doing that to all of the street lights across the city? Now that's just disruption to life in the city, but it could cause a safety issue because now what if an ambulance needed to get through that area? But now we've changed the street lights, created great congestion. Now there's a concern about life and death. Now let's keep thinking like a malicious person. Now, what if what, when I caused all that chaos in that part of the city where public safety couldn't get through, I now took, uh, took control of the cameras and shut them off. So uh, public safety organizations ha had no view into what was happening. So they'd have to send more feet on the street out to that area where we're impacting life and creating a risk to safety. And then what, what if then I took it another step further where I decide, okay, well, all the resources are over here in this part of the city. I'm going to go to another part of the city and rob a bank, okay? Now, I'm sure we can think of nastier things like this. I'm in solutions architecture. I think about solutions. So I really don't have the completely warped mind to think of all the, all the horrible ways that we could manipulate smart cities to start creating all of this havoc and risk uh, to public safety. But I'm sure we could come up with lots more. Uh, we could probably talk to the writers of the different Batman movies because a lot of those kinds of scenarios pop up from Hollywood. So there's great risk that comes from having all of this intelligence across the network. Every time you have a use case, you're also introducing a new threat. And we have to consider all of these threats as we're rolling them out. All right, uh, any uh, questions or comments to this point? No, oh, okay. So insecurities, from insecure cities. So when, when those of us building smart cities think of that, we think of terms, it's open, it's accessible, it's efficient, seamless, interconnected. Those are all the words used with smart city. But when you have all of these things in any software system, it's true it becomes vulnerable, but it's also true in smart cities that the additional word we need to think about is vulnerable. You're introducing vulnerabilities when you have all of these other characteristics with that. And you better believe the threat actors are taking advantage of that. Who are the kinds of threat actors we need to be concerned about? Well, there's the script kiddies. And, and I want the students to be honest with me. Do you know any script kiddies? Have you ever heard anyone bragging about it? No? No? All right. Uh, Government-sponsored actors. Organized crime, uh, hacktivists, they're politically motivated, but there's a lot of that out there. 
and then insiders as well. We see that more on the enterprise side. So the cyber threats that we have, okay, so first you need to think about IoT devices that will be used in smart cities. S IoT devices are purpose built for a specific function. It's because of the quantity, it, uh, the quantity of them that are deployed, they need to have very low cost. So the CPU is for a specific function and nothing else. That's all it's built for is low cost. But then when they're deployed out there, they also need to maintain long battery life so that they don't need to be replaced. The specification that's used in industry is minimum 10 years battery life. So you have this low cost purpose built device out there for 10 years maintaining its battery life. And it's not built to do anything else. So that means it cannot run on board an anti-malware client. You have to provide the security from the network. That's your only choice with these IoT devices. You can't run a McAfee client, a Norton, Symantec client on an IoT device. It's not built for that. It's purpose built. You have to provide the security for IoT from inside the network. And because this is PDF, I can't walk through the animation. But the different threats that you have is an application DDoS attack coming in, hitting servers. You can have a volumetric DDoS attack coming in and hitting the network. You can have malware, as examples we talked about earlier, coming in and specifically hitting the IoT devices so that they can be remotely controlled. And then coming outbound, once they're controlled, they're executing botnets. So you have these, this risk at multiple layers, inbound and outbound. And the only way to control that security is from inside the network. You can't do it at the devices. So what do you need to provide that security in the network? Well, you need machine learning that has behavior assurance with behavior profiling. Uh, you need internet side security for things coming in from the internet. And then you need the device side security for, uh, to detect bad behavior coming out from the devices. Different ways to do this include the reputation database, malware signatures, behavior profiling, and then once you have the behavior profiling, anomaly detection. So putting it all together, you have a new device connecting onto the network. You do your behavior profiling and your behavior assurance. You run analytics on the traffic going through. And then you are able to implement your security functions once you have all of that data. So that includes being able to quarantine devices, detect malware that's coming inbound, detect volu volumetric DDoS attacks coming inbound and block those, and then also being able to run anti-botnet based on real-time behavior profiling and, and anomaly detection. So there's a lot involved in building the smart city security posture. You need the device security and access control, network security, anomaly detection, cloud security, and uh, in a lot of cases, it needs to be carrier grade because it's working on an operator's network. So thank you very much.